Hey everyone, this is Marcus Leto, the president of V1 Interactive and creator of Disintegration, as well as father of the Master Chief and co-creator of the Halo universe, and you're listening to Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. The Casanova Podcast, the number one podcast in Hawaii is brought to you by these contributors on Patreon. If you'd like to see more content like this more often, as well as more podcasts, reviews, impressions, early access releases, live streams, and original content, then consider becoming a patron today. All right, and welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikel Casanova, coming at you with another phenomenal interview. And in today's episode, I've got the true honor and privilege of interviewing the one, the only, the legendary and iconic Marcus Lido. Marcus is an icon and a legend in the gaming industry. He is the father and creator of the one and only Master Chief of the Halo series, as well as being the co-creator of the Halo series. And it's just, it's so phenomenal being able to have him here today on the show. He's also the president, CEO, and owner, and creative director of V1 Interactive. And we're, we're going to be talking about his new game, the new IP that he's been working on that just released, and that is Disintegration. And we're going to talk about his career, his journey in the gaming industry, disintegration, V1 Interactive, and so much more. So if you're ready to do it, I'm ready to do it. Let's go ahead and welcome the legendary and iconic Marcus Lido onto the show. All right, and welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, The Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikhail Casanova. I am coming at you with a phenomenal iconic interview with the legendary the one the only marcus leto marcus how are you doing man <laughs> doing well thanks miguel thanks i appreciate that introduction i hope i can live up to it oh man it, the, the legend himself man. okay so uh go ahead and introduce yourself tell people about you if you don't know who marcus leto is i don't know what you're doing with your life but anyway <laughs> go ahead <laughs> all right yes Hi, uh, my name is Marcus Leto. I am uh, the creative director and president of V1 Interactive. I uh, have been in the video game industry for almost 25 years now mm -hmm. and have um, you know had a, a fun time making games over those uh, couple decades. I started out in the industry um, working uh, with a small studio out of Chicago named Bungie. And uh, we were working on a game called Myth, the Fallen Lords. And mm -hmm. it was soon after that game that um, I, uh, it was just myself and Jason Jones from Bungie who started working on a brand new game that we were real excited about. Um, and we cooked that game up for almost a year before adding additional team members. And um, we ultimately turned into, into something that is known as Halo today. And that continued growing for many, many years. Um, and then, yeah, I decided to uh, break out on my own again and start a new studio, see what we could cook up uh, with a new small team. And mm -hmm. uh, now we are just on the cusp of what well, we've already just released as of today, the uh, new game from our studio called Disintegration. Yeah, and Disintegration is available uh, for the audience. If you guys are curious, it's available on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Steam it is a phenomenal game. I did a review for it. Uh, definitely uh, the links for that will be in the description below for both video and written review. It is, th that game is so amazing. Like, I, I really want to just, like, how what was the conceptualization process for disintegration like what was that moment where you're like okay we need a new i want to do a new ip and uh 
like what went into the the gameplay, the style, the the Maddox? Like, yeah, <laughs> it actually started out uh, purely as a fictional exercise, just mm-hmm. to write some ideas about what this universe could kind of be like and what things could live in it and how uh, things would function in this universe. Mm-hmm. And so I spent a long time after leaving Bungie just writing ideas for a, a whole bunch of game ideas uh, from little teeny things um, like mobile games uh, and then giant AAA games and uh, fantasy fiction, you name it. It was just like kind of this walkabout exploration period of time that took almost two years just to kind of figure out what I wanted to do next. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to rush into anything. Mm. I didn't want to take a job at some other studio or or just, you know, start making uh, uh, little games um, that, uh, you know, just one after the next, hoping that one might uh, be successful. So I did, I, I, uh, I wanted to spend time to do things right and, uh, and figure out what, uh, what game IP to really start uh, hammering on next. Okay. So, yeah, the, the, the whole origins of this game started in its fiction um and it ultimately led to me coming back into that that fiction idea over and over again you know because i i had so many other plates you know spinning at that time Mm -hmm. and i said you know this one i think this has potential to be something special so um it was just myself at that time um no other no no nobody else to help me and i and i thought, okay, I had recently talked to a student from a school nearby mm-hmm. here called DigiPen. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, maybe I can contact this student. His name's Joe Arroyo. And maybe he might have time to help me out a little bit. He's still in school, <laughs> still finishing up classes. So he had limited amount of time to help me, but uh, he was happy to join. And uh, the two of us worked for some time. And then he brought some of his friends on one of his roommates uh nick and then a couple other students and before i knew it i had you know a handful of students helping me build a prototype ultimately then it whittled down because they had classes to attend to and it was just Mm -hmm. joe and nick who stuck with it and uh, we built a full prototype it took about a year and a half to go through that whole process we built it in unity and uh uh which was really fun actually it was a it was a it was a uh, it's kind of Unity's kind of like uh, Photoshop for designers, is one of my mm-hmm. friends used to put it like like that. So uh, it was a great experience, you know, to work through this whole process of building a prototype from and go through uh, like different stages of development with it um, because we ex- explored several different avenues for how the game could kind of take shape. Mm-hmm. And you know, during that process, it started out purely as a as a real time strategy game. Very traditional, like Mm -hmm. man selecting units from the sky, micromanaging everybody, telling this unit to go attack that unit, and Mm -hmm. you know that kind of stuff. That it it was built in the disintegration universe, but the gameplay had nothing to do with what we have right now. Wow! Um, And it it continued uh, on that track for quite some time until we we kind of just had this realization um, together as a group that we need to do things very differently. Mm-hmm. If this game is really going to stand out in the crowd from other games like it, we need to kind of really think hard about how this game could transform into something new. And that's when, um, after a, a lot of contemplation, and I had one of these moments of just really, uh, you know, kind of like a, a, a an awake moment in the middle of the night, like thinking about, I think mm-hmm. I know what we could try Mm -hmm. Um, i don't think it's going to be easy but uh, i think we can try taking that camera in the sky and turning them that thing into an active participant in in, in combat giving the player the ability to fly that a vehicle around we now call a grab cycle Mm -hmm. um give it omnidirectional movement outfit it with weapons and abilities make them an active participant in combat with units on the ground who are also firing at them and can blow them out of the sky. And then somehow try to figure out how we're going to manage those units on the ground at the same time. That was, that was really one of the things that took us the longest to solve. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, we made a lot of mistakes along the way, 
you know, on the on uh, on our path to trying to solve those problems. Um, but ultimately, we we came together with a prototype that uh, pretty clearly illustrated our design intent with the game, mm. and uh, that's when we started pitching it around to uh, to publishers. Nice, nice. I mean, and definitely, like when it comes to you know the the style of play, like uh, you know, for the audience, if you guys are curious, it's uh, FPS mixed with RTS, uh, and it's such I I've never seen an, an amalgamation of those two completely different styles of gameplay work so well, you know, in, in cohesion. And it's, it's like, I, I can't really think of any other game and I, I, you know, people can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that there is any other game like disintegration in that type of format. And it's just, you know, when you're, you're flying around in a grab cycle and you're commanding, you know, your band of outlaws going through the different missions and, you know, even with the multiplayer, I was finally able to do multiplayer uh, since it went live. And it's just, there's nothing like it. The game is just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that that actually was one of the most exciting things for us. when Because mm-hmm. as soon as we started uh, and moved that direction of like totally flipping the tables and just saying, mm-hmm. okay, we're, we're going to do something crazy here. And we're going to, it's it can be huge, a huge risk to us. Um, because there are a lot of problems to solve. I think other studios have tried similar things in the past, but there are no other games out there that were good blueprints uh, Mm -hmm. for us to follow. So a lot of what we had to do was just taking this journey on a road that was completely unfamiliar for us. Um, Mm -hmm. And that that was the hard part, because we had to we had to solve a lot of very difficult problems with uh, to avoid overwhelming the player by asking them to do too much um, Mm -hmm. with uh, flying this vehicle, engaging in combat and, um, and uh, also commanding those ground units effectively and tactically. So um, that's when we kind of like decided to throw away a lot of these preconceptions we ourselves had with, how a first person shooter should work and how an RTS should work and get it just down to the bare essentials, the things that really matter about each one of them to us. And it's when we started to think about it like that and really kind of honed in on just those bare essentials. That's when we got to this point where things started to click and things Mm -hmm. really started to turn into something truly unique. Um, It's taking that grab cycle first person shooter mechanics and continuing that uh, when it comes to engaging with uh, the ground units mm-hmm. and developing something we called a, uh, a, a command pulse. You fire it from your grav cycle onto the ground, and it will tell your units to move to a particular location where they'll autonomously then uh, take up positions of cover or engage in w- with units nearby. Mm-hmm. And that was really one of the t- toughest problems for us to solve too, because we want them to do th- smart things that, um, uh, you know, are, are contextually, uh, contextually make sense in that location mm-hmm. they're in and don't frustrate the player either at the same time. <laughs> um, but then it allows us to then take that s- a few steps further uh, and command pulse directly on an enemy unit to prioritize target them so you can mm-hmm. really fine tune what you're doing within your environment and then use it to, you know, engage with objectives in the environment or salvage that you want to um, uh, uncover so you can pick it up and use that to level up your units outside of uh, the campaign missions. Mm-hmm. But um, in addition to that, later on, then we added just this great secret sauce element to each one of the units by giving each one its own unique ability. So you can kind of treat them more like chess pieces on the mm. battle, on the battle space, and that then um, the way we engage it with staging those unit abilities in campaign uh, is just really cool. Like uh, because each one, if used to its fullest potential, can be uh, just devastating uh, in in uh, any kind of combat scenario, both mm. in campaign and multiplayer. Um, especially if you chain unit abilities up together, you can really create some really great um, hybrid effects as a result. Nice, nice. 
And, and, and definitely speaking to like the, the uh, companion AI, like it's it, typically when you play, you know, FPS or, you know, with you having to command like where they go and what they do, mm-hmm. typically the, the companion AI is not very smart. But in disintegration, like I never had that feeling like I do in other games where it's like, oh, okay, do I need to babysit them? Do I need to worry what they're going to do? And it's like, no, like if I send them to an area, I can comfortably like take care of something else. If I need to scan Mm -hmm. an area in the environment, if I need to attack a certain enemy, if I need to take down, you know, uh, a heavy I can make, I, you know, I, it's just that peace of mind that they're going to handle it. And then once they take care of wherever they're centered at, they'll come and take care of like it, it within the parameter, they'll take yeah. care of that. And it's, it's something like, I'm just wondering, like, do you guys have like the, the magic formula for the companion AI? Because like, I don't see that in other games. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Um, that was actually one of uh, Joe's greatest passions on the project. Uh, that that's one's that student who I was able to hire first, mm-hmm. um, right out of school. He focused on AI throughout the entire development of this game and just knocked it out of the park. Um, one of the smartest engineers I've had the opportunity to work with in the industry. And it's just fantastic to see how it developed and continue to evolve over the course of the game's development. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, it was a a very fine line for us to balance as well. Because part of the job of the player as the commander in the sky Mm -hmm. is flying that grab cycle around, um, staying as connected as possible to those ground units and effectively commanding them to mm-hmm. keep them in the right positions in the combat space, uh, keep them out of harm's way, uh, away from like mines that have been laid by the enemy units or mm-hmm. from explodables in the environment or from hordes of enemies that might overwhelm them. And uh, of course, it's your job too to use their abilities tactically uh, in mm-hmm. the mystic gameplay. So, so you're constantly managing them, but you're doing it in a more fluid first person shooter way. So it's, it's very like, Snap, snap, snap! Just really making sure that 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 uh, that combat loop feels fluid and active all the time. Mm-hmm. You've always got something to do. If you're not firing your weapons uh, yourself, you could be using utilizing your ground units in very effective ways. Um, but we also want to make sure that uh, as especially as you get up into the more difficult levels, mm-hmm. uh, that we throw some challenges at the player and. Um, and make sure that uh, the player really does need to keep track of where those ground units are and make sure that they're managing them well in order to be successful throughout each encounter. And so that uh, we didn't want to make them so autonomous that they could just clear out everything on the, on the <laughs> field them, themselves. So they do they really do rely on your effectiveness as a commander in the sky to survive well. And in mm-hmm. cases you rely on them as well to get through very serious gauntlets uh, that we're throwing yeah. at you. Uh, so it's a symbiotic relationship between the two. And we always think of the grab cycle and your weapons on board as just one part of the equation and your ground units as the other critical component to it that make a singular crew together. And it's that crew that acts as a singular character within the game. Yeah. And, you know, one of the other things, too, that I really enjoyed is, yeah. like, with the destructible environments, like, it's, I was shocked at the level of detail that you guys put into that. Like, if you're shooting a building, like, how pieces of debris will come off of it, and then eventually certain areas, like, if you, like, say you, you continue to shoot at a certain particular aspect of the of the building, or or if the enemy throws a grenade, or if you use one of the special abilities of your companions, like how it degrades and breaks realistically. Like I was shocked because you, you don't even see that in a lot of games, like even Call of Duty, well, some some of their entries mm-hmm. do kind of have that, but not to the extent that you guys have done. And it's just like how from, I guess from the um, uh, technical standpoint, were you guys able to achieve that? Was that easy within the Unity engine or? So uh, it's a key fact here that uh, once we finished our prototype 
in the very early stages and were signed with private division, uh, our publisher now, we made the switch over to the Unreal Engine. And that was a huge transition for us to make this, uh, this switch from uh, one engine that treats things in a very different way to like learning the Unreal Engine, which was like going from learning English to learning Russian. Like it was just to two totally different universes. Uh, mm. There are very few concepts that, uh, that actually transfer through. Mm -hmm. uh, where Unity had a lot of things that were just kind of like plug and play, and you could easily get things set up. Unreal um, had just unlimited amount of capability, but it's all you have to do everything from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, write your own, uh, build your own shaders, and uh, and build your own uh, content really from scratch in order to make anything work. Mm -hmm. um, so it took us a long time for us to just get up to speed with that engine, um, but it's uh, it turned out to be a really fantastic move for us because it's much better for the type of game we were making, um, especially when it came to things like destruction and handling uh, the performance on all, all three of the platforms that we were shipping on, mm -hmm. and because that's uh, a serious concern, especially like when we have uh, grab cycle that can fly up to a very high vantage point and have a huge view out in front of it. So it's rendering a ton of content. Mm -hmm. um, that's a challenge there, right there. And then blowing things up in the environment was one of our key pillars of making sure that uh, when the player is actually engaged in combat, mm -hmm. um, and just have that exhilaration factor of seeing things, um, there's all this kind of collateral uh, destruction from combat occurring around them. Mm -hmm. And then after combat's over, the environment itself kind of tells a story about what just happened there. Yeah, you see the the destroyed buildings and and the bodies of the other enemy robots lying all over the floor. Um, there's there's arms and legs and heads sitting all over the place. So it's just it's it's a it's a really it, it creates a story. You can kind of like backtrack and see what happened in that environment uh, and kind of uh, read it in that way. But it was a very huge challenge for us uh, because. Destroying things like that and having a lot of ragdolls from uh, dead enemy units uh, lying around on the ground is terribly expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of optimization for how we can handle that kind of thing had to happen, um, which took a lot, of, a lot of time for us to figure out how to do right. Um, and uh, a lot of the things, while the Unreal Engine gives us some great tools to begin with, um, mm -hmm. most of it we had to... We had to build on top of ourself um, to really customize the engine and uh, to accommodate the kind of game we were making. Oh, awesome, awesome. And mm -hmm. and as far as like the 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 level design too, like I I felt that every level within the game, like the flow from you know the the starting point to the end of the level to all the gauntlets you run into to you know the boss battles or protecting certain areas, like it it had a natural flow like a lot of games don't typically have that it feels like it's you know okay i'm here i'm there there's no correlation to why i'm here but everything within you know even from like the training level that you start off to get used to the game mm -hmm. it's a natural progression that's just so interwoven into the narrative like how did you guys do that we had a lot of fun building the the levels for the game, um, both in campaign and uh, multiplayer. Mm -hmm. um, because on on one hand, we're building two levels simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're building one that the graph cycle, the player themselves flying around uh, the environment, because they can fly up as high as 16 meters, mm -hmm. um, and then down as close to the ground as about uh, one and a half to two meters. And uh, so de uh, designing a level for that kind of movement to flow through the environment uh, fluidly while also giving the player vantage points and points of cover uh, so they can use that environment uh, intelligently in combat mm -hmm. was always challenging. And then I, as I had just mentioned a little bit ago, because you can get up so high, you also, we, uh, we, from a performance standpoint, we need to be very hyper aware of what the player actually can see and how mm -hmm. far they can see. Um, making sure that we can um, try to make those vistas as grand and awesome as possible, but uh, do it within reason. Um, 
And then the other hand of it is developing and designing that ground level um, mm-hmm. part of each one of the missions where the units filter through the environment in really interesting, cool ways around rocks and trees and through buildings and have lots of opportunity to take cover uh, and, and, um, and do in- interesting, intelligent things uh, themselves on the ground. Because one of the cool uh, things we can do that, uh, that are tied to the destruction we talked about a little bit ago mm-hmm. is setting up ground cover elements that are destructible um, and other things like that in the environment. So the player can see enemy AI you know, utilizing the environment, but the player and the uh, player's friendly units can destroy that, that cover for them, denying them cover and flushing them out, forcing them to move to other locations where you can then take advantage of those positions and do some really neat things uh, within the environment. So designing those levels um, was always a fun thing to do. And of course, that's a pacing thing. You want to make sure, too, that there's like these moments of really big combat and then there's kind of like these breather moments. And those are those moments where we allow the player, the groundiness, you know, talk to each other and they talk mm-hmm. to you, the player. It's a great storytelling um, opportunity um, as you're moving from then that location to the next major location uh, where combat might uh, uh, occur or uh, a major objective might exist. Definitely, definitely. And uh, as far one of the other mechanics that you have in the game is with like when it comes to reviving your 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 companions, your crew, uh, mm-hmm. by if they if they die in battle, basically you have roughly about thirty seconds or so to go mm-hmm. and get their brain can. And once you get the brain can, then within a couple more seconds they'll respawn and you know have a percentage of health come back. And that's a unique feature where you know typically in, in most first person shooters like. Uh, character gets incapacitated you got to go and manually revive them and Mm -hmm. it's become kind of you know routine and how a lot of the shooters handle it almost in a uniform way Mm -hmm. whereas in like rts's units die okay that's it uh but for you guys with the the whole brain cam brain can mechanic yeah how did um like what's the story behind that because it's very unique so yeah, uh, fictionally, because they have this, their brain is actually encased in an armored shell, the brain can. Uh, that, uh, that's what it's commonly called in our game. The brain can is attached to a robotic armature. If that robotic armature is exploded, the person inside is still alive in that armored uh, brain can, and that lays on the ground. It's got an expiration time, though, um, in, in campaign. So the player has, uh, we force the player, you know, to, to get out of their comfort zone, probably right down into the thick of things uh, where enemy units can fire on them to go pick up that uh, friendly unit on the ground. Your companions will remain alive for, like you said, 30 seconds or so. Mm-hmm. And you've got that time to go revive them, to save them. Uh, once they're saved, that brain can is like uh, jettisoned away and it's uh, reintegrated with another body and injects another uh, uh, fully formed character. Mm-hmm. So that that human person is it remains alive. Um, they can die, though. That's the thing that uh, if you allow them to remain in, in the battle space, uh, the enemies will crush it. And, that, uh, and that's... Uh, that's game over at that point. Uh, so mm-hmm. you reset back to a checkpoint. Um, so, and we, that was a critical element that we wanted to make sure from a fictional standpoint that we drive home to the player, that these are real people in these armatures uh, mm-hmm. in robotic armatures and that uh, each one of these people are still vulnerable. And uh, you kind of see that throughout the campaign in different ways. Okay. Um, one of the other things too, is with the, uh, you know, with the characters, like, you know, the banter between characters, you know, mm-hmm. with and, and with how Roma Scholl is, like, how, how when you were creating these characters, like, did you have like a point of reference or was it all from scratch? And, and, and with how they're portrayed now in the final product, was that something that you envisioned when you were starting? Like, they're, they're so even though, you know, they're in their, you know, mechanical armatures, they're so lifelike. Like you can't like, 
okay, case in point, like when I'm listening to Romer, uh, Romer Scholl's voice, which, you know, is done by uh, Jeff Shine, it, it's the way he's delivering the lines. And you could almost see his facial expressions just by hearing his voice. And not only for him, but also for like the entire voice cast. Like it's so well done that these faceless avatars that they're they're using come to life like you can see like in the cutscene and that's also going into like the cinematic aspect of it too being as well done as it is and i know i'm rambling at this point so i'll shut up and let you talk. <laughs> uh, i feel like we were real fortunate to uh find uh the actors for the parts uh, to really bring these characters to life. Uh, mm. Jeff Shine's a great example of bringing Romer Scholl to life in a way that while uh, we had spent a long time with the script and writing the words that Romer would say, Jeff brings them to life in a way that we couldn't e ever anticipate because he just, I mean, he he gets he gets the character. I, I'm going to get into this in a little bit. I know you talked about it a little while back because Jeff's awesome. Yeah. Other, other characters in the game, like Deborah Wilson, uh, actress. I mean, she's been doing this for years, and she's just so energetic and vivacious, and she's just, yeah. just such a ball of positivity. I love her, and uh, she brought that kind of character to Agnes mm -hmm. um, in our game as well. So it's just like uh, all of these characters come from all walks of life. And um, one of the fun things that I wanted to do initially with them when we first started working on the script was make sure that they don't all share the same common ideas. They don't all get along like perfectly. They're a diff they come from all walks of life, so they have different opinions about things. Mm -hmm. and, um, and some of them like each other better than others, and, they get, and some of them have trust factors with one another. Um, but they all have a common goal of surviving and, um, and really fighting for humanity. So they get to know each other and how to work with one another, uh, one another over the course of the campaign. Um, my only driving factor when it came to the beginning of writing the script mm -hmm. um, in which I was working with uh, my old my old colleague from Bungie, Lee Wilson, who uh, joined V1 to head up uh, all of our cinematics. Uh, so he was a primary driver with the writing of the script and then hiring um, an outside talent uh, uh, for helping write the script. Um, a uh, writer named Kip Knox, who mm -hmm. joined us to just continue writing that dialogue and bringing those characters to life over the course of the time. My only driving factor in the initial beginning of it was just like, I kind of want this vibe of um, like a Joss Whedon Firefly kind of thing where these characters, yeah. you know, it's a serious environment and a serious world that they live in, but they like to throw some shit at each other every now and then. <laughs> you know, because humor um sometimes is is just a really good way of you know like getting through some tough times together yeah and so um and then we were lucky really to find some of the some of the actors who i think connected very well with with the uh the character that they're playing uh romer or jeff shoal that <laughs> oh boy i'm really gonna <laughs> jeff shine um, and I, I mean, he, I think he connected to Romer because uh, like Jeff and I both share this, uh, this kind of passion and uh, love of motorcycles. Uh, mm -hmm. We both are motorcycle riders. It was, that was the whole reason the grab cycles exist in the first place is because I, I like to, I, I like to work on my own motorcycles. I built one from scratch. I like to, I like to know like what's in that engine and how it works and I have that kind of connection with it in that way that I wanted the player to feel like as a pilot on a grab cycle with hands right in front of them, that they feel that connection to this vehicle around them. Mm -hmm. And I know Jeff shares that same connection and he brought that so well to his character in Romer. And, uh, and it's, it, it's so evident when you listen to him and uh, throughout every one of his scenes. Yeah. It, it really did. Like it just, the, the, cadence the pacing the delivery like it was just so expertly done like the entire voice cast it's just it, it, it's you know from both the gameplay and the cinematic experience is just 
perfection. Like I, I absolutely loved it. Wow. I really appreciate that <laughs> uh, because a lot of hard work went into it. Um, there was a ton of effort put into the script and writing of it. Um, initially it was about three inches thick. We probably could have filmed a three plus hour movie and maybe it would have had been a two part series because it was, so long. Um, but we boiled it down, got it down to something that, uh, Gosh, I mean, when we're all done uh, with cinematics, we have about 40, I think about 45 minutes of cinematics in disintegration mm -hmm. with a 30 person team. And really uh, of that team, there's only four or five of us working on cinematics. So wow. um, yeah, that's, that's nuts when you think about it, because uh, that's a lot of work, but Fortunately, because we're so small um, as a studio, we can actually, you know, be pretty efficient with how we're handling things. But and that's something that I'm not used to because, you know, at Bungie, we had 300 people working on a project at any given time. And I had an entire cinematics team that's mm -hmm. as big as my whole team at, at V1 Interactive now. So um working with a very limited resources uh, was challenging um but i'm super proud of what we were able to pull together as a result yeah you guys did a fantastic job and and that's one of the other things too and you know i, I definitely want the audience to know that you know the when you're playing the final product when the when, when the controller is in your hand just definitely know that there goes into that so much from the scenario writing the the game designers, the graphic designers, the audio team, the visual team, it, there's so much. And I know for myself, like with having the recent games that one that was recently announced, uh, Resident Evil 8, as well as Resident mm -hmm. Evil 3 and Resistance, when Capcom was out here uh, in Hawaii actually doing localization, they were doing, you know, audio capturing and, and visual capturing. Mm -hmm. I got to work with them by way of my friend, uh, Ruben Langdon and it was awesome getting to see how much behind the scenes goes into the development of these games and into the NDAs or you can't say anything like oh Mikhail yeah. what, what are you doing or or Marcus what are you doing oh nothing <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's so true <laughs> uh, yeah yeah there are there are so many moving parts to making a video game and to coordinating, making sure that they get done uh, in timely enough fashion so that they work in concert with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a time where we don't like put the pinch on uh, any particular discipline in the studio too much, like audio is always going to get the, the end of the stick when it comes to like, everything comes in at the last second. And, mm -hmm. and fortunately uh, our audio guy, Jack, um, is just fantastic with being able to tackle all that stuff um, uh, and deal with it um, uh, professionally. Um, but it was just Jack and and um, one other co contractor at the time who we just brought on full time doing all of the audio for the game. Like it's nuts how how much content went into the game. Not just from I mean not just thinking about the sound effects that go into the game, but also the the musical score that's written and integrated into a dynamic music system and all of the unit chatter and dialogue system that works mm -hmm. uh, organically as you move throughout, throughout the environment to tell that kind of story, that um, the additional story elements as you're playing each mission. Mm -hmm. Those are so complicated. And um, yeah, uh, when it came to making cinematics even, like we were... Uh, we knew right away we're going to have to buy a motion capture studio, um, uh, like systems for wow. our for our own studio. It's teeny and it fits in our server closet. I mean, literally, <laughs> we have a, a little room down in our office uh, that's maybe twenty feet by fourteen feet, mm -hmm. and we carved out a portion of it just to be a motion capture stage for ourselves. Um, so we have a a very inexpensive. Um, um, entry level Vicon system that's set up and we can capture three people sim simultaneously. And it was like, we were just getting suited up and jumping down into the mocap studio almost on a daily basis to get these cinematics done. But it was, it was fantastic because it was just, if we had a really cool idea about how a scene might play out, mm -hmm. we'll kind of like talk about it together as a team. And then we'll just go shoot it downstairs. And uh, probably in by that afternoon or the next day, have a rough setup of it in the cinematic and that it was that kind of efficiency and that kind of, you know, like 
ability to just work and like really be on our toes um, that allowed us to get as much done as what we did. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, with everything that's in disintegration, you know, from the a full length feature packed single player campaign experience to, you know, incredibly robust multiplayer mode, like all this with a, a retail price of forty nine ninety nine as of the time of this recording, that's you got you have games that are like you know fifty nine sixty nine seventy nine ninety nine that don't even offer as much or even a fraction of the value that you guys have put into this. Like how? <laughs> well, you know, originally when we first signed with Private Division, um, mm. the game was so much smaller in scope. Um, uh, we were promising maybe a four or so hour campaign, um, and a very small multiplayer component, um, mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't half as much as what it is today. Um, it wasn't until I started hiring on some of the talent, uh, to the studio, um, mm -hmm. we were bringing on people from that I had hired back at Bungie, who I had the pleasure of rehiring back at V1. Uh, who I had worked with, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And um, I knew what they were capable of doing. Mm -hmm. um, they were known qu uh, quantity to me. I knew that they were going to bring uh, a certain talent to the studio that uh, really was going to raise the bar. Mm -hmm. But I also didn't anticipate just how important it was also to bring on some of the new talent, like straight out of school, um, that brings this energy and this fire and this really great, you know, like vibe to the studio. Mm -hmm. that, um, they continue to uh, just increase the, the logical scope of what we were building together um, because everyone was bringing such great energy and, and ideas to the game with every additional person we bring on. Uh, so it was my job just to kind of like keep that contained as much as possible, but allow mm -hmm. it to expand and, and allow that energy and positive you know, element to continue to like turn the game into something really special. And one of the primary things that we upheld uh, all throughout development and that our publisher also agrees with is just making sure everything is as high a quality as we possibly can make it. And that's not just how visually it looks, but how it performs, how it mm -hmm. functions and how it feels. And so it's that mutual you know, like understanding of what's important about the kind of game that we're building that I think was, uh, was a real driving factor all throughout development, that we didn't want to take shortcuts mm -hmm. just to get something done, that we do it right or don't do it at all. And that's probably this weird Midwestern thing that I grew up with in my, in my, <laughs> in my <laughs> upbringing. But uh, I really believe in that. Like, in, like, try to do it right. Don't take shortcuts. Like, mm -hmm. do the right thing. And uh, it's going to be hard sometimes, but it's going to pay off in the end because what we'll have then is a much more flexible, a much more extensive kind of game system that we can play with then as a result. And um, I'm really happy that we were able to do that um, and that Private Division was uh, uh, had the faith, you know, to like continue allowing us to do that throughout production. Yeah. And, you know... Uh given everything that's going on right now, uh, not only in the country, in the world with the, the COVID-19 outbreak and, yeah. you know, how was dealing with that uh, do, on top of having like the deadline, having to work from home, you know, release schedule, uh, the PR side of it, it that I, I don't envy you, but <laughs> I want to know like what was, how was that trying to release a product during uh, this type of uh, pandemic? Uh, I we, we we never anticipated this happening, of course, and um, nor did we ever really believe uh, when the pandemic hit and we were and it was clear that we were going to have to all work from home. Mm -hmm. um, we really were not sure, or nor did we believe that we would be able to actually make it through this final phase of the game's development. Because there were a lot of technical challenges associated with that. Not mm -hmm. only just people working from home efficiently, 
but um, a lot of hardware is at the office, like the motion capture studio I was just talking about, um, mm -hmm. or the fact that we're all on these custom, very expensive dev kits for the Xbox and PlayStation platforms that are tied to IPs that are static to the office that we have to be at. So, like, how are we going to make this work um, mm -hmm. in a way that's reasonable? So for about two weeks, we were really fretting, um, mm -hmm. just trying to figure out um, we were at zero capacity as far as our efficiency was concerned. And uh, it was, we slowly stepped it up one step at a time, getting each one of the employees up up to speed, being able to remote into their computers when they needed to or work efficiently from home. Same thing with the dev kits. And then, like I said, this is right at the end phase of our project. It's when those most difficult to fix bugs are presenting themselves. And when you really need to be tightly connected with your team in order to get through this period. Mm -hmm. um, so we stepped our game up and uh, uh, got a lot more disciplined about how we were communicating with one another um, uh, virtually um, mm -hmm. and how we were meeting with one another virtually. And, you know, I, I, I can't believe within maybe three weeks or so, or so we were up at 50 to 80% efficiency. And then it just continued growing from there. Oh. Now we're 15, uh, we're 15 weeks into this thing. And uh, if you told me 15 weeks ago that we'd actually be successfully launching today, I would have mm -hmm. told you you're nuts, but, uh, <laughs> but we did it. I couldn't believe it. We actually went through certification on each one of the platforms uh, which was tough because they're also dealing with the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Well, so that everything just became more protracted as far as the time it took to get anything done. And um, somehow it all worked. I, I mean, <laughs> it's unbelievable, but uh, it worked and I'm really happy with, uh, with the game. So, but it's not, it's not done. I mean, we know that uh, we're already, we've shifted gears. Our studio has into, like supporting the game post-launch with new maps, mm -hmm. modes, new crews, and all kinds of other good stuff that come along with it. But we're also there listening to the community, uh, looking at what's working and what's not, and actively working on uh, improvements for the game. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, um, it's it, it'll continue evolving uh, post-launch, um, mostly with new content, but also with uh, uh, modifications to existing features and that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, a lot of my friends in the industry talking to them, to them with, you know, pushing out stuff during this pandemic has been very difficult, but I, you know, I, I commend all of you for being able to work under these conditions, especially with the things that you need at your offices like that. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine. It's well, definitely made us rethink a little bit about how games can be developed. And, you know, while I prefer having everybody at the office, um, because there's just this great camaraderie of having everybody there together um, and everybody, uh, you know, like able to hear conversations that are happening within the office so they can get excited about something or just help problem solve something immediately. Um, it's comforting knowing that um, if we have to, uh, that we can work fairly efficient from home. And that um, I think one of the things that I was pleasantly surprised by, too, was just how many of the employees from V1, you know, take it seriously and, and stepped up their game to, um, you know, really do remain e efficient um, and not treat this like some extended holiday, for instance, so, <laughs> which I don't think anybody does because they can't really go anywhere. They just... Yeah. Where are we going next? The living room, the backyard. I don't know, but uh, they're they're enjoying uh, the fact that they have freedom, you know, to, um, you know, to work on the game throughout the day, um, and also you know just be home with family and loved ones and and uh, stay connected. So there's there's a silver lining to this as well um, that we all recognize. Um, but that said, we can't wait to get back in the office together and start making games uh, again together. Definitely, definitely. And as far as like V1 Interactive, like what are some of the uh, the core values of the company? Like what, you know, so the interactions with your team, like what, what are some of the things that you absolutely love about the company? When I set out to make V1 Interactive um, after leaving Bungie, 
Mm-hmm. Um, I did take my time before I just hopped into building a new studio. I did want to think a, a lot about what was important about the new studio uh, to me uh, and and uh, what I, I would like to do in setting the, the kind of the, the ground rules for the new studio. Um, a big part of it really was finding balance. Um, I was one of the few employees at Bungie when I first joined um, mm-hmm. that had children. And um, I was in my mid twenties. I had uh, I had young children, um, and and it was hard for a lot of the people at the studio to get that I didn't want to sit around in the office till eight o'clock every night. That I actually wanted to go home and be present with my family. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of regimented myself to focus on work while I'm there at the office, and then I could unplug and go home and be with my family. Mm-hmm. I valued that, and I felt like um, that's a tough thing to do. Oftentimes in the in the gaming industry, um, because the the demands on each employee are are great in in many cases, and I wanted to make a studio where uh, everyone felt the flexibility and freedom to mm-hmm. be home when they needed to be home with their friends, with their family, with their loved ones. But not just that, but to like be home and, and like get outside for crying out loud, go on a bike ride, go on a run. We're all pretty active at the studio. And I like the fact that we're healthy um, that way and we're healthy mentally um, as much as we possibly can be in this industry. Um, but uh, to like remain as healthy as we can, um, because when you're healthy outside of the office, um, you bring that kind of like positive energy into the office with you then and you remain healthy in the office and that directly translates into the kind of things we make together mm-hmm. and you can, t- you can tell when a game's made by people who are are happy or are not yeah um and so i uh i really wanted to make sure that that was one of our primary focuses and that uh the other big part of it was remain small um i like a small studio i like mm-hmm. uh, a, a place in which everybody is hands-on and everybody is critical path to the success of what we're making. And everybody's taking some part of ownership mm-hmm. in what we're building together. So there's no, I don't sit in a, in a room all by myself and just tell people what to do or anything like that. Um, that's a terrible way to lead anything. So I like being part of the team, sitting mm-hmm. with the team, um, I work on making stuff just as much as my business partner Mike does all day long. I mean, we're we're getting our fingers greasy every day in the engine because we love working on making games. I mean, it's a privilege and it's an honor. I feel like to be able to make games for a living, and uh, I I think of it more like a hobby than anything else. So I really enjoy it. Um, but doing it in a more organized and effective way is often challenging, <laughs> but, uh, but we, we do our best. And I like that small team atmosphere where everybody also um, has this uh, growth potential within the studio. That was another big part of building V1 where we all wear lots of different hats. Um, I'm a content developer and a creative person on my side of things. So like for me, exa- in a, uh, for example, um, I like, not only just designing things with the design team on the project, but building the levels. Uh, the first handful of levels were mine that I built. Mm-hmm. And um, so I put on my environment artist hat and my level designer hat, and uh, I'll do that. In the early stages of prototyping, I had to build and animate all the characters, uh, build all the effects and all that kind of stuff. And that was just really fun. I love that part of it. Um, So it all depends on what's needed on that particular day or week um, and then put on that hat and enjoy it. In addition to running the studio, maintaining the studio's relationship with our, with our publisher and um, doing all the things that are expected of a president of a studio on that front as well. So there's no shortage of things to do during the day. That's for sure. (laughs) But, uh, (laughs) but I really do enjoy it. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, winding down to the last couple of questions, being, you know, completely respectful of your time, because very grateful that you carved out time for us today. Uh, one of the things I, I one of the questions actually from the audience that I have here uh, is they want to know, like, what can a, 
expect going forward with like the future of the franchise? Like, can we possibly see uh, maybe a series like a, a an anime TV series or something like that, a Netflix Ooh. series, or you know, because there's so much to the world, there's so much to the lore, like that you know that there's way more going on than what you're seeing just. I'm glad you recognize that too. <laughs> when I started working uh, on the fiction for the universe, um, and then we decided to, and then we like carved out the story that we we're going to tell. Mm -hmm. It has a great beginning, middle, and end to it, but it's a very small portion of a much larger universe that we're developing. So, yes, there's a lot of potential for um, more stories to occur within this universe, whether or not it's through a sequel or through ancillary things such as an, uh, like an animated cartoon or comics or other things like that. That'll all depend upon the popularity of the, of the, uh, of the franchise and whether the community really embraces it and wants it. Um, uh, we're here as a studio to listen to the community and oh. to really focus on the kind of things the community is interested in uh, pursuing as well. I think that's true specifically um, with the game itself and how the game is going to evolve post-launch. Like, where are we going to take multiplayer and uh, and what other kind of cool features can we really uh, think of that the community would enjoy? And so we'll be focusing and, and really listening uh, to what the community is saying on that front because the community is so vital to our success and to um, just our the health of our uh, game and our um, uh, just any trajectory we take moving forward. Okay. And um, one of the other questions from the audience is: Is there any potentiality of the game being ported to the Nintendo Switch and or upcoming? You know, the next generation of consoles is mm -hmm. around the corner. Is there any possibility for that? If if you can't answer that, that's fine. We, you know. I can't answer all the questions. I I can't deny that we haven't tried porting some. Hey, there's a button that allows us to port stuff right out of Unreal to other platforms. Oh. Those buttons have been pressed. So uh, there's, <laughs> there's been some exploration there. Um, to the new console uh, platforms, I'm real excited about um, what they have to offer and uh, where we can take the game uh, potentially on them. But uh, there is no news yet on that front. Okay. And uh, other than that, uh, let's see, any other questions from the audience? Um, yes, I had one uh, question from the audience. Uh, they wanted to, and this is all stuff that I've, got typed up and i'm like oh that one okay that's highlighted that's purple. Right. okay so that's from now <laughs> so uh one of the questions uh from from uh our audience here is uh how does it feel knowing that uh you know not only making an iconic character and romer show but also having being you know being the father of master chief and having helped co-create the the world of halo to not only know that those that series is still going strong, but that it's a defining moment in many people's gaming life and even gaming careers in that you were there at the genesis of it. You know, you helped create it. You created Master Chief. Like, how does that feel knowing that you've created such an iconic character and, and, and franchise? <laughs> it's very humbling. Um, I mean while I was there at the very beginning of the Halo franchise um, in helping build that universe and designing the Master Chief himself, um, it was an, uh, an army of people that really helped bring the Master Chief to life with his story and the writing and the cinematics team and the animation and all of the other great stuff that came along with it, along with, you know, um, every one of the partners for the for the game to just help get it out there and then the community itself and what the community did and just bringing that uh the imagination of that universe to life in so many different great ways um that was a fantastic uh journey to go on uh throughout the the development of that franchise from beginning to where we left it off with halo reach mm -hmm. uh, and uh handed the keys over to 343 to continue making Halo from that point on. Um, I can only hope 
yeah, to recreate some of that in the future with Romer Scholl and with Disintegration and all of the other great characters that are uh, existing within this universe. Um, I know that there's a lot of exploration, a lot of territory for them to cover um, mm -hmm. that is going to be really interesting. So um, there's a ton of potential there. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping it connects with our community and uh, they help us continue to uh, make it grow over the next uh decades who knows definitely uh, i'll say this you don't need to hope it's it's a guarantee because you've you're, you're blazing a new trail and that trail is burning bright it, this wow. game, this franchise the world that's what i'm saying like just knowing that there's so much more going on in the world of disintegration beyond <laughs> just what we see with romer shoal and, and the outlaws it's there's Yes, I I'm very confident. I'm very yeah, confident. I love to hear that, and I really appreciate that, Miguel. Um, the, the 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 last question I have uh, is, you know, what are uh, you know for the audience who may be interested in getting into you know the video game industry or developing games or working alongside the game industry, you know, what advice would you give to them? Yeah, that's a that's a good one because you know when I joined the video game industry, uh, it was pretty much uh, do anything you can uh, to get in uh, and wear as many hats as possible and learn as much as you could on your own because there were no schools for it. Mm -hmm. There were no disciplines that uh, really like um, had anybody coming right out of school that was designed or you know, like geared up to fill a, p a particular p uh, position within a studio. That's very different nowadays. Um, it's it's a lot harder to get in, um, but um, I th I think the the biggest uh, bit of advice I can really help give is uh, be well rounded uh, with your skills. Like if you want to uh, uh, focus on a design position or an engineer position or artist within a studio, um, be as well rounded as possible. But target what you're really after. Um, uh, with regards to a specific role that might be open. Do your homework on who to talk to in that studio if you can mm -hmm. and uh, figure out how to address uh, via email and uh, tell them what you're passionate about. Tell them the kind of things that I think that you think you can bring to the studio that they would uh, really appreciate. Um, it's that kind of like drive, self, like self-driven capability and um, example of being organized on that front that I think uh, really catches the eye of um, of employers like myself um, when I'm looking at uh, at uh, resumes and that kind of thing that are coming in along with their portfolios. So um, yeah, be focused and uh, be positive, uh, and uh, and I think you'll find a, a foot in the door somewhere. Um, this industry is growing. Um, mm -hmm on a daily basis it's getting so big and so it's more mature now um and it's uh, it's a fantastic business to be in um so uh really i'd welcome you with open arms uh come on in and have fun with us it's an awesome industry to be in <laughs> yeah and and like one of the things that i i tell people like you know in my capacity as an independent games journalist and a content creator working alongside you know developers and, and getting to meet people such as yourself and, and reviewing games that you know coming up in the 80s and 90s like you said like there was no roadmap for that no. and you know with the thing now you have the internet you have social media mm -hmm. you have so many ways to to work in some type of capacity to to work alongside or work in the industry and you know, if anyone tells you that, oh, you know, it's just playing video games, it's not work, uh, ignore that, you know, and, and never let anyone tell you that you can't do it. Like for me, I'm, you know, English isn't my first language, it's actually my third language. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, know okay. This is my third language. You know, I'm dyslexic. I also have you know, mild autism and I was told that I would never be able to, you know, write articles or to be able to graduate high school or college or do anything. And, you know, also had cancer and went through that. And, you know, I've, my whole life people have told me what I can't do. And instead of trying to prove other people wrong, 
prove to yourself that you can do it. You know, Absolutely. push yourself, keep going yeah. forward. Because- Amen to that. <laughs> it is so important. Um, I, I don't deal with some of the uh, issues that uh, I know you're dealing with, with, uh, with cancer and such, but um, I had, um, I mean, going through school, uh, mm-hmm. I was not a very good student going through college and I was in the graphic design program. Um, I think there was a, a huge lack of a, uh, of faith or uh, and a serious amount of doubt in my ability uh, for my family, you know, to actually do anything realistic with that, uh, with that degree um, and whether or not it would be uh, a fruitful f- uh, future whatsoever. Um, but um, I was c- determined to just continue learning as much as I possibly could every day and to never let anybody say no. Um, uh, same thing happened even when I left Bungie. Um, like a lot of people said, don't try to start a new studio. You're crazy. It's way too hard. Um, 95% of them fail. Um, within the first year, it's going to be a really, uh, it's going to cost a ton. Um, and, um, Hey, um, I ignored every one of them and, and look at where we are today. And, And I don't regret it at all. So there you go. And uh, I actually have a final question to, for you. I lied. <laughs> it's all right. Did you, did you have fun? I love making this game. Um, I, <laughs> I still love making this game. Or, like, seriously, like, it was kind of thing where um, I'm an empty nester now. My kids are both in their early 20s. And I, as I had mentioned earlier, um, I, I just like making games is like a hobby to me. So, and this was just something that the more we developed it, the, the more it came to life for me. And it, uh, it just got more and more exciting over the course. Now, of course, there's like, there's, um, there's challenges along the way that are really difficult to solve, um, both with the game and with, you know, managing the studio and the people mm-hmm. within and all the things, the complexities that come along with that. But, um, gosh, man, it's such a rewarding thing. Uh, in the end, and it's such a great family of people that I get to work with now as a result, and uh, really brings me a lot of joy. I I love it. Awesome, awesome. And is there anything you want to leave the audience with before you go? And did you have fun on the show? <laughs> I did. Thanks, Miguel. I, I, this is great. Actually, this is one of the more um, uh, relaxed, comforting kind of interviews. I really appreciate that coming from you. That like this is this is nice. Um, I, and I and I again. I wish I was there in person. Um, <laughs> that would be that would be nice. I really could uh, get out on the islands, um, but um, we'll make that happen again some other time. Hey, you know, when whenever all this blows over, if you ever come to Honolulu, you need a place to stay. My wife and I we have a five bedroom house. Uh, if you don't mind cats. You know, just two kitties and, and one big one. We got plenty of room. We've got literally the the lower half of our house. We we just, we didn't, uh, well, we were doing an Airbnb, but right now it's like we have a house and we don't know. Like, it, it, trying to get a house in Hawaii is almost impossible, but like we that, saved dear up. Dear Lord, it's got to be so expensive. We, we, we saved up. We, we bought it. And it's uh, literally, if the back... The back view of our house, if you are in the kitchen, you're looking out through the window, you have Waikiki and Diamond Head Crater. Like, it's right Damn. there. <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. That's, yeah. that's awesome, dude. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I'll take you up on that deal someday. Definitely, definitely. And uh, with that being said, people, uh, links to all of uh, Marcus's social media, as well as for disintegration, as well as for... A V1 Interactive and Private Division. The links are all of that will be in the description below, as well as links to uh, PlayStation Network, Steam Store, and for Xbox Live if you want to purchase the game. I highly recommend you guys do so. It is one of the best games of 2020. And to me, it's in my top five of 2020. So uh, you guys know I only look into games or, or, or review games that I enjoy, and I have to say this is the game i've enjoyed the most of 2020 so get disintegration it's out now on the major platforms and you won't you can't go wrong with it there's so much value to it and you can, ca- you can catch this I'll episode you, uh, of the pod. <laughs> yeah i'll see you uh, online i hope 
Yeah, definitely. You guys can catch this episode of the podcast. on It's laid out right here. Uh, YouTube, TuneIn Radio, uh, Google Play Music, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Pandora, and iHeartRadio. And if you want to support the podcast, we are fully independently operated. Uh, it's available. You can support via Patreon as well. And uh, with that being said, Marcus and I are signing out. You guys have a great one. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, did you enjoy this episode of the Casanova Podcast? Well, I'm sure you did. And since you did and you're wondering where else you can find it, you can find it on every podcasting outlet. Yes, it includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Launchpad DM by Podcast One, and so much more. And the only thing I ask of you is if you truly enjoyed it, even if you didn't enjoy it, please leave a rating and tell us what you thought of it, what you liked, what you didn't like, and everything in between. And also, if you're looking for video formats of this podcast and many more, you'll be able to find them on youtube.com slash Mikhail Casanova, as well as on twitch.tv slash Mikhail Casanova, and new episodes every single Monday morning, 8 a.m., Eastern Standard Time. So, that being said, this is Mikhail Casanova, Hawaii's favorite YouTuber. I am signing out. You guys have a great one.